Hi everyone. So today we're going to be talking about the very subtlest understanding of dependent arising, remembering that all things are empty because they dependently arise. They're empty of inherence, independence, self-existence, etc. So it's important that we understand this subtlest level, that all things are dependent on a valid basis and a mind's imputation or labeling. So mere designation is a very subtle thing to understand, but we're going to go into it more deeply today, even though we talked about it last Wednesday. I think that you understand about causes and conditions enough, about karma, about cause and effect. It's something that we'll keep coming back to again and again, but I think that the idea of things relying on causes and conditions is pretty clear. If you have questions, please email me. But, um, this idea of things relying on parts and whole and context, I think that that's also quite clear. Things existing in a context because of history or conditioning or background framework or karmic conditioning. These are conversations we've had a lot. What we haven't dug into more deeply is this idea of Mir's designation. So, here we go. Okay, so we stopped here on Monday, avoiding the extremes of permanence and annihilation, remembering that permanence means something different in this context, that the extreme of permanence refers to absolutism or eternalism, which usually means the impression that things exist from their own side and believing that things exist from their own side and that they have to exist from their own side in order to function and be real. All right, I don't have to tell stories. What do you think would happen if you didn't tell the stories? Are you being yourself? How am I not myself? How am I not myself? Myself. Myself. How am I not myself? 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 What if this is as good as it gets? Oh. That's one extreme. The other extreme, I think everyone understood quite well, the extreme of annihilation, which refers to nihilism, the idea that nothing exists whatsoever because you can't find it. Nothing. He believes in nothing, Lebowski, nothing. Nothing changes. Nazis. They were Nazis, dude? Oh, come on, Donnie. They were threatening castration. Uh-huh. Are we going to split hairs here? No. Man. Am I wrong? Well, he... he man, didn't. they I'm were a... nihilists, man. Huh? They kept saying they believed in nothing. Nihilists. Me. I mean, say what you want about the tenets of National Socialism, dude. At least it's an ethos. Yeah. Are these the Nazis, Walter? No, Donnie, these men are nihilists. There's nothing to be afraid of. So those are the two extremes, fueled by ignorance. We're going to move on now to looking at mere designation on a valid basis, the subtlest view. So we're looking at mere labeling and the criteria for a valid base. I read out quite a few things about this topic last Wednesday. So try and just really hear it very deeply and consider what the implication of these ideas are. So mere labeling on a valid basis is the subtlest level of understanding dependent arising. Coarser is dependent upon parts and whole and context, that middle one. And then coarsest is dependent upon causes and conditions. And that level of dependency only relates to impermanent phenomena. The other two relate to all phenomena, both permanent and impermanent. So in brief, mere labeling is the process of designating phenomena. 
So whether it's literal labeling with words, or it's just the ability to distinguish and differentiate one thing from another, how is it we're able to make distinctions in the first place? This is the conversation. In brief, a valid basis is what one can attribute labels on to in an accurate way. So we know that we can't label a desk an elephant. We can say that, but no one will believe us. But why is it there's agreement when we point to something and say that's a table and everyone says, oh yeah, sure. How can we agree if there's nothing from the side of the basis? This is the important conversation because we're saying there doesn't have to be anything from the side of the basis in order for us to come to agreement, but that doesn't mean that there isn't external objects. From the middle way consequence school perspective, there are external objects, but they don't inherently exist. So mere labeling first, and then we'll look at mere designation in a minute. In the case of a bell, the bass has to have a certain shape and perform the function of ringing. This is what validates it. So this was talked about last week, but just look at the criteria for a minute. The shape and function, that's what validates it. So we could hear that as basically worldly convention doesn't argue with that fact. If it's the shape and size and color, if it performs the function, then we can label it what we label it. That's what kind of stamps the validating label onto it. What's the force behind all this? It's karma. So just sit with that for a minute. How is it that karma makes us label what we label? How is it that we can label things and come to agreement about them if we all have individual karma? And don't jump to any conclusions. Don't rush to the answer. Hold open the question and just think about it for a minute. Okay, so more on that. The force behind all this labeling, it's karma. We're jumping texts now, looking at how things exist, the green one. There it says, the definition of karma is the intention arisen from the principal consciousness, meaning the primary consciousness, the main mind. So karma is our own mind. Everything comes from our own mind, from karma. Not only that, but everything that appears to us comes from our own mind, from ignorance, at this stage in our development. So just put a pin in that mentally and we'll come back to it. But now we're going to go into valid basis. So a valid basis being what one can attribute labels onto in an accurate way, as was said before. Lama Zopa Rinpoche says, for things to exist, mere labeling by mind is not enough. There has to be a valid base, not just any base, a valid base. Thus, there are three kinds of mind that can harm or invalidate the existence of what appears to be, for example, a bell. And this was talked about last week, but just look at the summary here and see what impression it has on your mind. So the first criteria is another person's valid conventional mind doesn't harm an omniscient mind, the Buddha's mind, a Buddha's mind doesn't harm or invalidate. 
And the wisdom realizing emptiness doesn't invalidate. So analysis of the ultimate. What this means is you say, look, here's a bell. And someone who is not ill or under the influence of drugs or in a kind of dream state, someone with a valid mind, a valid conventional mind, says, yep, I agree. And an omniscient mind, which can see relative truth and ultimate truth simultaneously, also agrees conventionally. It's a bell. And the wisdom realizing emptiness, under analysis of the ultimate, we realize it's not a bell from its own side. It's empty of existing as an inherently existent bell. But still, we can attribute the mere label bell. So it's an interesting criteria. Probably the first one is the one that makes the most sense for us, which is basically worldly convention. So not opinions on top of convention, not good bell, bad bell, Tibetan bell, Israeli bell, bell at a hotel, not those extra attributes, which are a lot more in the realm of opinion, which are of course still from karma, etc. We're talking about kind of the raw convention. So that level is a criteria for a valid basis. You seem to alternate between viewing your own mind as an unstoppable force and as an inescapable curse. And I think it's because the only truly unapproachable concept for you is that it's your mind within your control. You are the master of your universe. Okay, so don't worry too much about it, but try and at least understand the first one, that for something to be a valid basis, another person's valid conventional mind doesn't harm or invalidate the existence of it. Okay, so that should be pretty clear, at least the first one. Now we're going to look at this division between truth and truly existent. And you may have heard all of the Buddhist teachers talk about something being not inherently existent and also not truly existent. Sometimes they're synonyms. So we're just going to unpack this a little bit. This is from Geshe Jumpa Techok, Inside into Emptiness. This is a supplemental text, not part of your course materials. So Geshe said, Truth exists, but there is nothing that exists truly. That sounds odd to say at first, but when we understand the meaning, it makes sense. Truth does exist because emptiness is true and because ultimate truth is true. Emptiness is true because it is the meaning discovered by the wisdom of meditative equipoise of an Arya directly realizing emptiness. It is also true because it is undeceiving in that its way of appearing and its way of existing are in harmony. So those are big sentences with a lot of words. I know that some of it makes sense right away, no problem. You're familiar with this concept. And some of it is maybe not words that you're used to. What you want to look at here is, in the second paragraph, emptiness is true because it is the meaning discovered by the wisdom of meditative equipoise of an Arya directly realizing emptiness. So remember, an Arya being is someone who has already realized emptiness directly, perceptually, has achieved the path of seeing. 
So an Arya being is someone who is part of the ultimate Sangha. They don't have to be a monk or a nun, although they can be. An Arya is simply someone who has realized emptiness directly. While they're in meditative equipoise, meaning in complete meditation, on emptiness, emptiness is what is discovered by that wisdom. It is also true because it is undeceiving, it's non-deceptive, it doesn't lie, it's not contradictory in the way it appears and the way that it exists to that person meditating on emptiness who has realized emptiness. So appearance and existence are in harmony to someone with that wisdom, which is why we say emptiness is true. Although emptiness is true, it is not truly existent, because to be truly existent means to exist independent of everything else. Nothing exists in that way. All phenomena have their own entity, nature, and characteristics, which mean they have unique functions. Different objects perform different functions according to their different characteristics. Yet being able to perform that function is not something that exists in and of itself, independent of anything else. That is the reason for saying that even though everything has an entity or nature, nothing exists by its own entity or by its own nature. Similarly, each phenomena has its own characteristics, but it does not exist by its own characteristics, because it exists dependently. Each phenomena has its own nature. That it has that nature is established by a valid cognizer, or valid cognition, because that phenomena is realized by that valid cognizer. Does it exist by its own nature? Its nature exists. A valid cognizer establishes it, but it does not exist by its own nature. While things have their own conventional nature, they do not exist by their own nature. In fact, own nature, Swavava, is the object of negation. Existence by its own nature is not realized by a valid cognizer. So things have a nature. They have characteristics. They have defining features. They have uniqueness. But the fact of that is not what creates it. You can say this is different to that, or this is unique to that, but that fact isn't coming from the side of the object, or created by the side of the object. In addition, a valid cognizer analyzing the ultimate realizes the non-existence of things existing by their own nature, thus, the nature of a phenomena exists, and at the same time, it does not exist by its own nature. Similarly, each phenomena has its own characteristics, but it does not exist by its own characteristics. As we have discussed, there are two meanings of true. One is established relative to the Arya's wisdom of meditative equipoise on emptiness. The other is established relative 
to conventional valid cognizers. So remember, valid cognition was the discussion you had with venerable children when you discussed Lorig, awarenesses and knowers. But basically, it's something that is not out of sync with worldly convention. There's more to it, but generally speaking, not under the influence of wrong conventional truth or believing wrong conventional truth. In the case of the former, emptiness is true. Conventional objects, such as the object, are false because they appear truly existent, whereas they are not. Thus they are false. Everything other than emptiness is false. The other meaning of true and false applies to conventional valid cognizers knowing conventionalities. Here, the meaning of not existing as it appears differs. In this case, a val <coughs> in this case, a table is true, real, because it is known by a conventional valid cognizer, and a reflection of a table is false, unreal, or untrue because there is not a table there, although there is the appearance of a table in the mirror. A table is a conventional truth, but that does not make it a truth. The use of the word truth in the term conventional truth reflects the fact that an object is true for the true grasping ignorance. That's who it's true for. It's true for someone with ignorance which is why we call it false or unreal. However, that does not make it true for the wisdom of meditative equipoise of an aria. The word truth in the term ultimate truth means it is true for an aria's wisdom of meditative equipoise on emptiness. This is why emptiness is an ultimate truth. It exists the way it appears to that wisdom. Thus, the reason for calling something truth in terms of conventional truth and ultimate truth is different. It is judged according to different criteria. Some dependent arisings are conventional truths. Others are ultimate truths. For example, emptiness itself is a dependent arising, and it is an ultimate truth. The table, the people in this room, love, compassion, and wisdom are dependent arisings, and they are conventional truths. The emptiness that is an ultimate truth and a dependent arising. Each phenomena has a conventional nature and an ultimate nature. Each phenomena has both. So both ultimate truths and conventional truths have both an ultimate nature and a conventional nature. Their ultimate nature is their actual mode of existence, their emptiness. Their conventional nature is that they exist by being merely labeled and exist dependently. That's their conventional nature. With respect to both table and the emptiness of table, 
each one's conventional nature is that it exists by being merely labeled, and each one's ultimate nature is that it is empty of inherent existence. Don't think that emptiness is some faraway absolute, independent existence, unrelated to ourselves and everything around us. In addition, while nothing exists ultimately, all phenomena, including emptiness, exist conventionally. If something exists, it exists conventionally. That is the only type of existence there is. Ultimate existence, as opposed to ultimate truth, ultimate existence is the same as inherent existence. They are synonymous. And that does not exist at all. Initially, it might sound strange to say emptiness exists conventionally, but when we think about the meaning of these terms, it becomes clear. Okay, let's get started. Is this part of my investigation? Yes. Say this blanket represents all the matter and energy in, in the universe, okay? You, me, everything. Nothing. Nothing has been left out, all right? All the particles, everything. What's outside this blanket? More... More blankets, that's the point. Blankets, everything. Exactly. Exactly, this is everything, okay? Let's just say that this is me, right? And I'm, what, 60 odd years old, and I'm wearing a gray suit, blah, blah, blah. And let's say. Blah. And let's say over here, this is you, and you're, I don't know, you're 21, you've got dark hair, etc. And over here, this is uh, Vivian, my wife and colleague. And then over here. And then over here, this is the Eiffel Tower, right? It's Paris. And this is a war, and this is a, a, a museum, and this is a disease, and this is an orgasm, and this is a hammer. Everything is the same, even if it's different. Exactly. But our everyday mind forgets this. We think everything is separate, limited. I'm over here, you're over there, which is true, but it's not the whole truth. Because... But it's not the whole truth, because we're all connected. Because we are connected. Sure, 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 sure. Okay? Yeah. We need to learn how to see the blanket truth all the time, right in the everyday stuff. And that's what this is for. Why? Why what? Why do I need to learn how to see the blanket thing all the time in the everyday stuff? Well, you would... Well, you wouldn't want to miss out on the big picture, would you? Uh-uh. That's partly why you're here, right? Uh -huh. And this is... And this is it. I'm talking about it right now. I mean, it'll take a while for you to get it, you know? But... It'll help you. How? When you get the...
when you get the blanket thing, you can relax because everything you could ever want or be, you already have and are. That sounds pretty good. Sounds very good. All right, get in. Get in. You want me to get in? Mm -hmm. So get in here? Yeah. What's going to happen to me in there? Oh, hey, you're going to see. You'll find out. So back to mere labeling. In the case of a bell, the bass has to have a certain shape and perform the function of ringing. That's what validates it. What is it then that causes us to label things positive or negative? What's the force behind all this? It's karma. So now we're switching to how things exist the last chapter. Because of past karma, some people are able to label things positively while others have to label them negatively. The underlying cause is karma. Therefore, you can see how crucial it is to purify past negative karma and not to create any more. In other words, how essential it is to practice dharma. So the ignorance, holding the concept of true existence, is like a farmer. Karma, the action motivated by this ignorance, is like a field in which various types of crops can grow. Consciousness, on which karma leaves all the imprints, is like the seed. And of course, seeds also have imprints. One tiny seed carries all the potential to grow a huge tree with many billions of branches that cover a huge area. Similarly, karma multiplies from one action many effects of a similar type. Like a seed, the consciousness on which karma left all the imprints contains all the potential. The consciousness continued from your past life to this life and will continue from this life to your next life, carrying all these imprints. The imprint left by karma on the consciousness is then made ready to bring its own rebirth, its own future samsara, the aggregates, by craving and grasping, which are like the minerals. That is called becoming, or potential existence which is like a seed becoming ready to produce its sprout. The next life, or rebirth, starts with name and form, which is like the sprout grown from the seed. After that comes the sense bases, or six sources, contact, feeling, and then in terms of experience, old age and death. So those are referring to the Twelve Links, not in the order of teaching, but in the order of experience. The conclusion is that from morning to night, from birth until death, whatever happiness and suffering we experience, and whatever good and bad objects appear to us, they all come from our consciousness, which carries all the imprints. Everything that appears to us, from birth until death, comes from our own consciousness. All the different experiences we have of people, places, and sense objects come from our consciousness, which carries the imprints. It is not only that everything appears to us today, and from birth until death, comes from our consciousness, but also that the whole appearance of samsara comes from consciousness, which is our own mind. Not only that, but it comes from karma, which is also our own mind. As we discussed earlier, the definition of karma is the intention 
arisen from the principal consciousness. So karma is our own mind. Everything comes from our own mind, from karma. Not only that, but everything that appears to us comes from our own mind, from ignorance. Bye. Wait. What? I don't know. What Just do you wait. want, Joel? Just wait. I don't know. I want you to wait for him. Just a while. see anything that I don't like about you. But you right will. Now I can't. But you will. You know, you will think of things. And I'll get bored with you and feel trapped because that's what happens with me. Okay. Okay. your heart Look around you Change your heart It will astound you So karma may seem romantic, the way we repeat patterns year after year, relationship after relationship, job after job, life after life, but it is actually extremely poignant, tragic even, how we keep reinventing the wheel. Consider the way things appear falsely to your mind as more than merely labeled and try to break the habit of believing all the lulls in life, all the triumphs, and all the tragedies are as they seem. They're not. Okay, so I hope mere designation and mere labeling is something that's starting to make sense, the way in which everything depends on that. Now we're going to shift gears and look at the object of negation, or the object of refutation, meaning the inherently existent self, the self that doesn't exist even nominally, even conventionally, even relatively, that pretender. So we're going to do a meditation looking for the object of negation, trying to find it, and then dispel the idea that it is as it seems. So we'll use a process called the fourfold analysis in this meditation, and it's not something that's necessarily been introduced to you before, but don't worry, we can talk about it next week. For now, just try the meditation and see how it goes. Okay, see ya.